Hello, my family. Have you been feeling down, maybe even depressed, waking up in the middle of the night, unable to go back to sleep? Maybe you've had a relationship that has been compromised. Maybe you have been abandoned by somebody you had been close to, and you don't know why. Maybe you've been ghosted. Have you felt like you're ill for unknowable reasons? That is, you haven't been sick for a while, but all of a sudden you're feeling sick, whether physically or emotionally. Well, these are the symptoms of spiritual attacks, demonic attacks. And in this day and age, there are an unleashing of demonic attacks that are unparalleled, certainly in my lifetime. I have heard from many hundreds, if not thousands of people who have communicated with me as to their going through something which is just highly unusual. Some have lost loved ones and they are feeling depressed. Obviously, they're feeling saddened, but this goes beyond just normal sadness or grief. There is an attack that's going on in our world today that is unparalleled in modern times. So obviously, I have been in deep prayer and prayer with others as well as to what is going on. And I have a clear message for you today as to what is happening in the spiritual realm. I have some familiarity, as many of you know, with the spiritual realm, having died and entered into what uh, we call the second heaven. That is this place of spiritual warfare where demons, fallen angels, and angels of God Almighty are warring against each other for the rights to your soul. But they also are warring over your physical nature. They are warring over the relationships that you enjoy. They are trying to destroy your family. But in that warfare, there's only one of two possibilities. One is which the demons have the victory, and the other is that the angels have the victory. What's the difference? Well, the difference is what we do and what we know. Because if we are ignorant, that is, we don't understand what's going on in our lives, we attribute it to some incidental consequence of of something like uh, an argument that perhaps happened or or maybe uh, just uh, didn't take your vitamins today, something like that. But if we're unaware of the spiritual effect of what happens in the second heaven that's translated into our world in the first heaven, then we're sitting ducks. And for you who may be unfamiliar with that term, uh, that is a Western term, it means that we are left vulnerable, that is open to the attacks of the enemy. And that's what's happened to a large extent today. We have been made vulnerable by our ignorance foremost of what's going on. That is, we cannot identify the types of demons who are attacking us. And yes, I'll be talking about three specific types of demons. That is, they fall under three categories of demons that are attacking you and me today. As some of you know, I had recently been struck with a bout of pneumonia that was very severe. And I didn't know if I would make it. And many prayed for me and delivered me of the demonic attacks I have been under demonic attacks from quite a few, as you can well imagine. But each time, each time, the Lord God has gained the victory. And of course, I've gained the victory. And I want you to gain the victory over the demonic attacks in your life. Because you may have heard of that old saying, ignorance is bliss. And I'm a very happy person. Well, if... if we are ignorant of these attacks and who they are and how to 
how to guard against them and how to defeat them, then we are ignorant not to be blissful, but to be depressed, to be sad. Moreover, to be brought to a point where we cannot live out our purpose, our life, to the fullest abundantly as God has called us to do. So this is very important for us to not only understand, but to take back territory from the enemy. Now, usually these demons will target those who are on the proverbial playing field, those who are closest to God, those who are acting out in prayer. Maybe it's a prayer over your loved ones. Maybe it's uh, something that you are active in and helping others, whether it be a small group or just having a conversation and being a prayer warrior for Christ. In other words, those who are doing and living their life as unto the Lord, as it says in Colossians 3.23. Well, we know from the Bible that these demons have very, very powerful means by which to attack us. In the New Testament, it tells us of those demons that can make people mute or blind. And you see those verses on your screen. Others can cause those they possess to harm themselves. And we have had, on some occasions, up to five or six people who have contacted us saying that they are ready to take their own lives. And we've followed up with them, obviously, immediately after receiving those messages. But it's because of a demonic attack. And you'll see the scripture in Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20, which signals that type of demonic attack. Some are territorial spirits that are referenced from the passages that uh, we are showing you on the screen now. And those uh, attacks that are territorial of nature, I want to explain to you what's happening from heaven through the second heaven, that is the place of spiritual warfare, as it translates into our world, that there are assigned uh, territorial uh, demons and angels And every uh, demonic spirit, what they do is a perverted aspect of what God has established in heaven. So when God authorizes from God's throne room, when he authorizes the angels to be sent over territories, could be our city, our nation, even our own household, He specifically assigns those archangels and those angels that are assigned specifically by God to the territories to break through the barriers that are the strongholds that demons have gained. And we have many of them in our world today, as you've noticed, in cities that have been overridden by crime and by places that uh, maybe were... uh, somewhat open to uh, Christian practices that are now being closed. Those are demonic strongholds, territorial strongholds. So that is the uh, perverted aspect when the demon strongholds uh, can take your territory, your neighborhood, and even your household. Now, I've got to tell you uh, that uh, these demons and angels are quite spectacular to say the least. Uh, if, if you were to behold them as I have beheld, beheld them and as many of the, with whom I've interviewed have beheld them, uh, in, in your physical nature, that is with your body and your eyes, um, you probably would drop to your knees shaking. These are mighty, mighty figures. And of course, the, uh, the demons uh, who are more in de- a decayed state because they don't have the light of life, that is the light of Jesus Christ, so they are in constant perpetual decay. Those demons still have that, uh, that powerful grip. 
that is that that mighty presence to them, albeit that which is of a uh, creepy nature. Well, you know, if you're in Christ, you don't have to be frightened by that spirit because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That means that you have the authority through Christ who abides in you through the Holy Spirit to call on the defeat of those demons. Now, the angels are quite spectacular in a different way. Uh, when I beheld the angels, they came in different forms forms. I did a study on angels. You can go back to it and find out what the different types of angels are uh, in heaven and on those who have been released on earth and within the second heaven with different assignments that are specific to God's intention for what they must do. But those angels are very, uh, the archangels at least, are very gallant looking. They have armor. It's, it's, it's glowing. It's shining. And it's shining from the light of Christ that shines on, on those archangels. And then there are those angels that look, well, they look kind of bizarre. You know, the, the uh, angels that are, have uh, heads, multi uh, heads and figures that uh, are very otherworldly looking uh, that also I've talked about and explained in, in other messages uh, that also uh, serve to war over uh, the territories that uh, we are in. So as I said, I'm gonna be talking about three specific assignments of demons that are currently affecting our lives today, wherever you happen to live throughout the world. There is an outpouring now. There is a calling out of these demons and angels. I'll be talking about the demons and how the angels can, through our own prayer and through our own worship, uh, affect the uh, the opportunity for these demons to gain control over our lives and over our worlds. So I'm going to be talking about these three types. I'm going to be talking about the Judas spirit, the Jezebel spirit, and the Pharisaic spirit. You can really group all of these demonic attacks under those three, which are released for this present time this present time. You see, there's been a release from the pit of hell, and this happens from the pit of hell in the second heaven because God does not allow any of this demonic activity, of course, in heaven. But based on what happens in the second heaven, it can be released to the first heaven, which is our world uh, here. So there are periods in history when there are types of angels that are released as in the time of Jesus Christ with the pharisaical demons that, of course, we all know, were attacking Jesus. Also, in the Old Testament time, we know of Jezebel. I'll be talking about Jezebel, the queen. And that spirit of that time in the Old Testament that is impacting us today and what that means. And then there's the Judas spirit. We're all familiar with Judas and how he betrayed Jesus Christ. Now, what do all of these have in common? These three types of demons are attacking you and me. Anyone who is born anew, anyone who is maybe the Lord wants to get your attention, wants to save you, perhaps, wants to deliver you. If you're feeling vulnerable, these demons are coming after you. And again, don't be a sitting duck. Don't be one who is at the effect of these. It's time to take back territory. God does not want us to be at the effect of these demons. We don't have to live with them. Now, the, I'll start with the Judas spirit. It may surprise you to know that the Judas spirit that had uh, given over Jesus essentially to the Pharisaic demons, the Pharisees at the time, is alive and well 
today. That same spirit that caused Judas to act upon this demonic deliverance of Jesus into the hands of the Pharisees is alive and well today. What does that mean? That means that that same Judas spirit will deliver you into the hands of the enemy. So the Judas spirit is the demonic angel that causes a person to be oppressed or possessed. What's the difference? An oppression is when you have that depression or that sadness, unable to sleep at night, waking up in the middle of the night, um, this, the malaise that you may be feeling, and the possession that can happen uh, is one who allows that demon to then have at it within our lives. Now, I don't believe that as a believer in Jesus Christ, as you are covered in the blood by the blood, that you can have that possession, full possession by the, the demon. But there are instances where those who are at the effect are kind of like on this, this fence, if you will, can be indeed possessed by a demon. And that person that is affected by the Judas spirit that is affecting you will flatter you, will maybe be somebody who is apparently a friend to you, maybe even a family member, and they have stabbed you in the back. Well, you can, instead of blaming the person, and you can, you know, certainly the person is not released of any fault. That person invited and wittingly or consciously that uh, demon to possess them or to, to affect them. But the, the person really is afflicted with a Judas spirit who seeks to be a friend. That is, in a, there's an assignment then. When that person is affected by the demon, there's an assignment on that person. They want to be your friend with the Judas spirit. They want to ingratiate themselves with you. Only, only to, and this is key, only to enrich himself or herself. It's to grow their popularity or their selfish agenda. Uh, in our case, for example, here, there's somebody that wants to, uh, I've, I've been approached, for example, with people who want to be on our show. Uh, and I've, I've said no uh, for reasons that I believe that they're, uh, their motives were unrighteous, uh, that they would have a negative effect, and they were uh, doing it for selfish reasons, and it, it didn't really um, jive, if you will, with what the Lord was uh, speaking to not only myself, but the team that we have here. Well, I've been attacked by those some of those people. I mean, viciously attacked. Uh, now, they were very nice when they wanted to be on the show. There were all kinds of, you know, Randy's a a really great person and all this and that. But once I said no, or once I, I went, once I kind of called out some of what they were, they, I felt that they were uh, doing or uh, kind of acting selfishly or in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in a way that is uh, self-aggrandizing, then they turned against me. That's the Judas spirit. That's the Judas spirit. And it's happening in your life. I know it's happening in your life because this spirit is pervasive and there have been these assignments uh, from the pit of hell, uh, of these Judas spirits that are all over, all over, and they are very, very strong. Like so many uh, people uh, today, the promise of a quote unquote big ministry and big money uh, fed Judas's prideful image in the day that he was part of the disciple group for Jesus. So he was part of this, this group now with Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was a big dude, right? He's, he's hanging around uh, the Christ. And the same thing is happening today that this person of, at the effect of the Judas spirit and the Judas spirit in particular wants to hang out with those who are active in ministry. And so in Matthew 10, we read that Jesus called the 12 disciples and it's interesting to note that Judas's name is listed last in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, so that uh, in the portion of scripture, we see Jesus, uh, quote, gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of disease. 
And Judas, who obviously made the decision to follow Christ, uh, pursuant to Christ's invitation, uh, he was a disciple, that is, he was a student of Christ, was given power, that's right, given power by Christ to heal the sick, as with all the disciples, to cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out uh, devils. He was given equal opportunity with the other disciples. So what does that mean? That means that even within the church we might find the Judas spirit. Even within a circle of, of Christian friends we may find the Judas spirit. Uh, G- Jesus entrusted even the money bags to Judas. Now if Jesus entrusted Judas with the money bags and, and the Judas spirit wants to control our finances or the finances of a church and the church has been robbed of money because of the Judas spirit and they've been unwittingly giving over that money bag. Now, obviously Jesus wasn't unwittingly giving these money bags to Judas. Jesus was compliant with some of these things because he was called to go to the cross. But he was charged and brought to the cross by the spirit of Judas and the pharisaical spirit as well. Now, most likely Judas had a high opinion of himself. And those who with the Judas spirit have a high opinion of themselves. They lack humility. Humility, by the way, is the most common expression in heaven, but the least common expression on this earth. Now he was called into that ministry, quote unquote, uh, giving him the excuse, excuse he needed to justify his actions. So that's that's another modus operandi of the Judas spirit. They want that inroad, and they will get into the church if they can, and in the inner chapter, uh, inner halls of ministries and leadership positions and things of that nature. Obviously, his darkened heart, that is Judas's spirit, uh, abandoned the poor. Uh, he didn't have a heart after the poor. So many wealthy people who hoard money, uh, also today, down through the centuries, who are not giving of their wealth, that is, they're hoarding their money, uh, they are also inclined to be at the effect of the Judas spirit, to be either oppressed or possessed because they just want to increase their wealth, increase their wealth, and you see them, you know, multiple homes and... I'm not just going to, if you have multiple homes, God bless you. I, I love you for it. I'm, I'm so happy. But there are those who, uh, who hoard their money. And when people are in need, they're not willing to give of the resources. Um, that's the Judas spirit. Let's face it. Many religious people today would far rather support um, a big name or a big church, uh, rather than get into the trenches with uh, small ministries. You see them. Uh, There are those with the Judas spirit who are attracted to somebody maybe who's um, on the big stage, you know, a Christian even. Uh, And they'll give to that person because uh, they're they're drawn, they're attracted. Those who are at the effect of the Judas spirit are drawn by that uh, that individual or that particular ministry, which is out there in, in the public domain, kind of the celebrity Christian, as I've called them. Um, but they're not uh, entirely supportive or not supportive at all of the smaller uh, ministries that are true to God. And that's reflective of the Judas spirit. All right. Judas had three and a half years with the Son of God. Can you imagine three and a half years he had with, with uh, Jesus? But his idea of the Messiah, obviously, was, to, was, uh, was not to accomplish the things that uh, God had intended uh, for the people of Israel and, of course, uh, subsequently the Gentile people based on, uh, based on God's standards. He was doing this based on his own religious standards. Now, I know I've, I've gotten uh, some criticism for uh, my prior message to talk about the religious spirit. I'll get to that when I talk about the pharisaical uh, demons that are in effect today. But when I talk about the religious spirit, I'm talking about 
the spirit of the pharisaical spirit and also the Judas spirit. So good religion, as the Bible tells us, is looking after the widows, uh, those who are poor, those who are in need. That's good religion. That's a practice of religion. But when the practice of religion becomes not one of being directed by the Holy Spirit, but by being directed by a, a, a religious, more selfish mentality, that crosses the line. It's no longer honoring unto God. Remember the sheep and the goats, you know, the goats went to the Lord and said, well, we've done all these things. And, and the Lord said, well, I knew you not because um, I, you know, you, uh, I was poor and you did not feed me and so on and so forth. Okay. An example of the Judas spirit's effect. Let's, let's be clear on this, please, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some time ago, a person with a Judas spirit came up to me and tried to entice me with a, um, uh, a feature film or uh, a documentary. That's happened a couple of times that I've turned both of those down because I'm about honoring Christ, not myself. Ooh, you know, I cringe when I even said that. <laughs> Dear Lord, forgive me. I'm at the effect of these spirits as much as you are, so I have to be in guard as much as you are, okay? But my point is this, that um, I was approached by this Hollywood producer uh, and uh, he, he, he said he wanted to feature my story and wanted me to contribute, okay? I just had a check in my spirit. I was sensitive to the spirit of Judah's spirit that was upon this person uh, and so he wanted, uh, he wanted to minimize the story of Jesus Christ. And it was a feature film I won't get into recently. It was a documentary with many of my friends, uh, and it, it kind of cleaned out the part about Jesus and meeting Jesus. So immediately my, uh, discernment, uh, was elevated. I knew that there was some ulterior motive for this person. And indeed there was. Uh, as I prayed about it and I identified the Judas spirit, I knew that this person had an ulterior motive uh, who wanted me to help with the film that he was creating that was not God honoring and also that, um, that he wanted essentially to uh, partner with, with our ministry uh, and bring in his, what he was doing into our ministry. And of course, immediately identifying the Judas spirit, praying against it, the Lord said, don't let that person into your world. Okay, that's what we need to do sometimes with the Judas spirit. We just need to block that Judas spirit uh, affected person from having influence in what we do. Because the Judas spirit is about money, influence, and status. And you can see how pervasive it is today. The Judas spirit is in ministries today. And you can see that. You know that, and it has been for, for several decades, uh, but a particularly, particularly uh, strong today. Someone with a Judas spirit typically knows your, you personally. They're not somebody from the outside. They actually want to again ingratiate themselves into your inner circle, but they will not confront you about something privately. Uh, they will use gossip or maybe even a public forum uh, to shame you. That's happened to me. Um, I've actually reached out to some people who have said something publicly and, uh, I've had the ability to reach out to them and say, Hey, have you, have you talked about to me first before you, uh, went in, uh, on social media, but what they were doing is they wanted attention. And that happens not just with me very minimally with me. Cause I'm a somewhat of a nobody, but, um, in terms of, you know, the big, big ministries, but I know I've worked with a bit of big ministries. I've served on boards of big ministries. And what happens typically is that um, they will uh, go on a, a channel or with their, their limited or sometimes larger social media sites and they'll start shaming somebody in the big ministry. They'll stop talking down to them or, or saying, talking trash, if you will, about them uh, because they've, they've gotten somehow their hooks into the inner circle. Uh, maybe they got on a show and they start talking, uh, I'll just say, that use the colloquialism trash against somebody. It's happened to us, you know, uh, thankfully on a limited basis where somebody starts talking trash. So that, that's what they do. They want to create their own, you know, 
own media, social media. They want to create, you know, their influence, and then they'll uh, try to use that for their own benefit. So if somebody cannot, and this is to the point of what you can do, if someone cannot privately address you on an issue and they have the Jezebel spirit, uh, then know that their public criticism is only for attention. So please don't take it personally. Their criticism of you is to look for attention from others. It's that old kind of bully effect, right? The bully is of the, at the effect of the Judas spirit. The bully is the one that uh, kind of uh, garnishes or, or fosters uh, those around them and intimidates those who might oppose what they're picking on somebody, you know, bullying somebody, if you're at the effect of bullying. And uh, then, you know, people start going along with the bully. And they also join in the bullying. If that's, if that's what's happening to you, uh, you really have to wall out uh, any personal effect. You have to realize this is the Judas spirit. The Judas spirit is coming after me. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, get thee behind me. As Jesus said to uh, Peter, who is being at the effect of, of Satan, get thee behind me. You have no impact with, no effect with me. The only status I have is a status that Jesus Christ has afforded to me because I'm a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. That is who I am. That's my status. That's my, that's, that's how I get my, um, ability to my, what is the word I'm searching for? My, um, my, in, my personal integrity comes from Jesus Christ and no one else. Okay. Sometimes with a Judas spirit, they can even use scripture. And this happens uh, quite often to uh, decimate somebody as Satan did. Satan did. Yes. Satan had the Judas spirit. That's right. Satan has the Judas spirit. Satan has all three uh, spirits, but there are some assignments within the demonic world of specific assignments that they've been giving. So the, Satan had the Judas spirit when he uh, tried to tempt Jesus. And I say tried to tempt Jesus. Jesus wasn't tempted. And uh, he tried to tempt Jesus, as we know from Matthew chapter 4 and Luke 4. Uh, when he argued from Scripture... This is Satan speaking. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple, that is. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, and on his hands they will bear you up. So how does that translate into your life? So Satan tried to tempt Jesus. He was totally blew it. I mean, Jesus was like... I'm sure I'm my, my interpretation, like, right. You want to offer me the world? I have, I have all my kingdom is higher than your kingdom. But anyway, um, we, we can be enticed. Can't we to, uh, to have a, you know, a bigger house or a bigger, this or bigger, bigger that, you know, and the Judas spirit will tell us, well, I'll give you a bigger ministry. I'll bring you to a bigger audience or I'll bring you to a bigger wealth or a bigger job or a bigger this or bigger that. Well, the Bible is clear that even uh, a person speaking as though they are speaking on behalf of God cannot be fully trusted. Cannot be fully trusted. You heard me correctly. That's right. We have to test the spirits. You have to test me against scripture. I don't want anyone to trust yours truly without being grounded in the scripture, without being grounded in terms of having others around who can, where, who can hold each of us accountable uh, if, we, if we fall away. Okay, the spirits must be tested as it says in 1 John uh, chapter four. Now God speaks against those who envision falsehoods in Jeremiah 23, 32, those, in other words, that have the Judas spirit by saying, indeed, I'm against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. So there are people who are saying, I had this vision of this, or I had this dream of that, and you can tell them by their fruits. So... If they're, if they're attacking somebody and they don't have love in their hearts, if they're attacking somebody and they're being, making disparaging comments and there's no real basis of attacking that person, 
And this happens a lot now today. I've noticed this happens a lot. And I want to warn my Christian brothers and sisters, if you're watching this, and you can relay this from, from me, because I've prayed a lot about this. There is an increase of attacks from Christians who are attacking others. That's right. There's an increase from the Christian community. And I've heard them. They'll attack so-and-so or so-and-so. And I want to tell my Christian brothers and sisters, start, stop, I'm sorry, stop attacking your own. We have enough attacks from society, from those outside of Christ. Stop feasting off of those who are in the church. If you want to criticize or call out something, you do it privately. You do it privately first, as is the biblical admonition. First, you approach your brother or sister. And many with public forums can be approached. But then, if they don't hear and you've done it twice, then you can go publicly. But those who go publicly first are acting. And there are some people I highly respect, and they are good, strong Christians, but still are affected by the Judas spirit who's oppressing them because they get angry and they go out there and they criticize so-and-so. You'll notice that I have made a point, made a point of not criticizing those who are, uh, maybe I've had a, um, you know, had difficulty with, or I feel that they're doing something falsely. I'll, I'll try to reach out to them privately, but I will let God call them out publicly. Okay. All right, we're doing too much in the Christian community, uh, especially with uh, some leaders or people who are in the public domain of, uh, of tearing down uh, sincere believers, born-again believers. So I've encountered that Judas' spirit, uh, and, and you can uh, well imagine having uh, released Heaven Storm, my newest book, uh, of having an eye, eyewitness, my spiritual eyes, of uh, the unfolding of the end times events and how, uh, as many of you know, uh, I struggle, not just, not with writing a book, which is I found after the Holy Spirit kind of took over and I started just typing away under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what I had difficulty with is my own ego, my own pride, thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be attacked because of this book, Heaven Stormed. I'm going to get really attacked uh, on this one because this one is unveiling the sacredness of the throne room and the unfolding of the end times and also Jesus' heart in his review of my life as he will review in your life when you go to heaven. So I've been attacked um, after uh, after publishing uh, Heaven's Storm. So uh, these are oftentimes from people who are maybe befriended me. And then they say, well, what about this? What about that? It doesn't really bother me. I, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, I, I don't hold anything against anyone who speaks against me, against heaven stormed away. I just pray blessings over those that do that. But it's still the Judas spirit that I know is is doing this. And uh, there's that simple prayer that Jesus uh, prayed when he confronted Satan, who was uh, uh, doubting Jesus uh, through P- Peter. He said, get thee behind me. It's as simple as that in dealing with the Judas spirit. Get thee behind me. Uh, I have no part with you. Uh, but the Judas spirit will uh, befriend you, attack you. And if you've been betrayed, ghosted, blind, uh, more likely... Uh, than not that Judas spirit was behind it. And you can call it that Judas spirit because these spirits thrive in anonymity. For those of you who don't know that word, that means they don't want to be revealed. Okay, the Judas spirit attempted to stop me from writing Heaven Storm. On many occasions, on many occasions, the Judas spirit kept telling, trying to tell me that you're not going to be criticized or you, you can't uh, reveal this 
because uh, your ministry is going to be a loss. What you've, what you've done in helping others is going to be uh, jeopardized by releasing heaven's storm, whispering fears that I would be attacked. And that's how the demons operate uh, in the second heaven, is they, if they gain the victory, in other words, if we have doubts, if we're not in prayer, if we're not uh, in the word of God, if we're not uh, trusting of, of the Lord God, then that gives entree to the Judas spirit to uh, speak doubts into our, into our soul. And there's a difference between the soul, which is, can be at the effect of the world and can be at the effect of these spirits, versus the spirit, which is isolated within us if we're born anew, which cannot be at the, at the effect of these spirits. And that's important to distinguish as well. Because uh, it's like a, our spirit is like a baby in the womb. It's isolated from the effects of the world and the second uh, heaven. If, uh, and, and so what happens is our soul, which is the animating part of us, can, is at the effect of these demonic spirits. And the Judas spirit will say to you things like, you know, um, you're not really, as he said to uh, Jesus, you're not really the Christ. Uh, you're not who you say you are. Yeah, I most certainly was went through his mind that uh, how could he uh, not uh, betray Jesus if he didn't doubt that Jesus was truly uh, the Messiah. So uh, in those cases with heaven stormed, I prayed against the Judas spirit. I said that, get thee behind me, Judas. And then I said, I said this, and this is what you can do as well. I said, dear Lord God, I pray that you had just bind this Judas spirit who's coming against me. And you would tell this Judas spirit that if he keeps on doing this, that you will put him into and bind him in shackles in hell by your authority. And I, and I, could, actually, I could actually sense the Holy Spirit saying, I will, I'll put fire he was saying to my spirit, I'll put fire on that Judas spirit. I'll put fire on him. He will be in shackles in hell and he will not be allowed to roam anymore within the second realm to impart his dastardly, do, uh, dastardly deeds uh, to uh, me or anybody else. So what happened? The Judas spirit went away. I was free. And I saw the, I, I've, I actually saw physically the, the, the room getting lighter after that happened. The Judas spirit was dispelled by the power and authority of Jesus Christ uh, because he was in me, he is in you, is greater than, than that Judas spirit. Okay. And that's from Revelation, by the way, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Uh, the Judas spirit is indeed the accuser of the brothers and sisters, those who are in Christ. Now, I'd been tempted to, uh, by the Judas spirit, but uh, thank God, thank God, he, God, delivered me from that Judas spirit. And that's why I'm able to share with you today uh, that Judas spirit came against me physically uh, when I was in, uh, in, on the bed uh, in suffering from uh, pneumonia and almost died recently. Of course, I did die clinically a number of years ago when I went to heaven. All right. But since the publication of Heaven Stormed, many have asked about the timeline of the unfolding of the end times. That's my biggest question from Heaven Storm. And my answer is this, because there have been those who have been fixated on timelines, you know, rapture, you've got pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, um, and there are questions, people ask me, when's it gonna happen? I wanna get out of here as quickly as I can. And I, and I say to everyone who asked me that, I said, you have a responsibility today. You don't have tomorrow, as the Bible tells us. We don't have tomorrow. But today, we have a responsibility to carry out the purpose, and purpose is that the Lord has ordained for us for each moment that we are in. The, uh, in this day and in this moment that God has given us. So this is one of my answer. I say this, our father knows the hour of Christ's return as Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 32. Only, 
only our Father. And I'll explain this through this verse. But And here it goes. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, so that anyone who says otherwise, beloved, is a liar. That's right. Someone could be at the effect of the Judas spirit. Remember, the Judas spirit wants attention, wants to, to be able to say, okay, the, the rapture happening right now, the, the tribulation right now, that we know the season, and I talk about the season, okay? But what does that verse tell us? It tells us, and this may, may be a surprise to you, that the Father is the only one that knows. That's what I beheld at the throne room that I'm writing about in heaven's storm. Don't try to uh, understand it with your physical mind. You'll understand it with your spiritual mind perfectly. But let me explain this. The Father knows when that appointed time is. And it's analogous, as you may know, about the wedding, not the wedding feast, but the preparation of the wedding you may have uh, been familiar with that par- parable, you know, the, uh, those who were um, preparing for the wedding should keep their light lit and in preparation because they don't know when the wedding is going to happen. Well, in the time, those times, the times of uh, the ancient times, uh, the times of the Lord Jesus and prior in the New Testament times, uh, the groom's father would call the groom out apart from the, uh, the one to, to whom he has proposed. Um, so they are separated for, for a period of time, sometimes a lengthy period of time because the father then spends time with the son. Father probably counseled the son uh, at that time, which is very prudent for today uh, when we have a son who is ready to get married. But, but that father pulled that son apart from uh, his, uh, his bride-to-be. And so the father knew when the son was ready to, uh, to go uh, back to uh, his betrothed for the wedding. The father would call out when the wedding uh, would happen. Only the father. And then the father in those days would then speak to the son and say, it's time. You're ready. It's time. And that is what is happening in heaven. Is that the Father and the Son are co-equal in heaven. As is the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. As one. As one body. The Godhead. Okay. But... Again, this is beyond mental, physical brain comprehension. But the Father will, will then give Jesus the sign because Jesus even doesn't know. That's right. Jesus doesn't even know. But on that, on that appointed time, and this is what I beheld in heaven, when God the Father spoke forth, it is done. Then what happens is Jesus Christ carries through. And that's his second coming. His redemption, his final redemption. Okay. Now back to the Judas spirit. Why is that important? It's because the Judas spirit has entered into our dialogues about the end times. And I want it to be crystal clear Anyone's the point says, this is the day, this is the time, absolutely, this is it. They can talk about the season, as I've talked about the season, but not the time. They are a liar, okay? So the Judas spirit lies about that and attempts believers into seeking human adulation at the expense of pleasing God because it would be very, very easy if I was tempted by the Judas spirit to say, it's going to happen that, um, you know, April 8th eclipse or it's going to happen on the... Um, it's going to happen on, uh, well, you may be watching this on April 8th, the eclipse has already happened, or it's going to happen on such and such, and these are the signs in the sky. And then all of a sudden, I'd get a million views. 
But that's what Judas Spirit would tempt me. But I'm not going to do it. Get thee behind me, Judas Spirit. Get thee behind me. You have no part with me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Indeed, the Judas Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, getting riled up here. The Judas Spirit only attacks people from within the body of Christ. <coughs> that's right. The Judas Spirit gets into the body of Christ and then attacks. Okay. Does the Spirit of, of Judas, I ask you, have his sights on you? Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 36 says this in the King James. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So watch your back. Watch your back. Because that Judas spirit is in your inner circle. Okay? Be careful. Okay, Judas will always show up in your inner circle, and it's not uncommon for the spirit of Judas to show up within your circle of friends, even some of your closest friends. Love or, or uh, you know, not anger, not hate, not vitriol. You know, I, you know, if if that opens the heart of the other person to do that, which uh, you feel called to warn them about or to encourage them to do. But the spirit of uh, Judas will flatter you, so be wary of flattery. Uh, I've gotten a fair amount of it, and I say thank you, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Do not flatter me, please. I know you've said kind things, and I love the kind things you've said. I love, it encourages me because I get a lot of the unkind things. So thank you for that. But I'll uh, just know that my response is, thank you so much, you blessed me. Praise Jesus, because all praises are unto God. It will, uh, Judas Spirit will uh, praise you uh, to use you as a stepping stone. Maybe you've realized that in your life. Maybe you've mentored somebody, help guide them, help even raise them, and they've turned against you. That's the Judas Spirit. And I, th I encourage you to stop uh, blaming the person entirely, but to speak to the Spirit, the Judas Spirit, to tell that Judas Spirit to get behind you. Or else, God will bind that Judas spirit and cast that Judas spirit into hell. The Judas spirit will, Judas spirit will almost entirely show up when you are up for a promotion to a new and important season in your life and your ministry. Be wary. That's when the Judas spirit will show up because all of a sudden you are being promoted either spiritually into a promotion into your ministry or into promotion into a new position of influence, that is when the Judas spirit is going to show up in your life. And he will act as your friend, offer a manner to help you, but he's not there to help you. He's there to help himself. Always remember that. Now, how do you identify a true, sincere person who's supporting you from one who's not? They will always lift up the Lord God. They will always be humble in spirit, not puffing up themselves. They will always support you, watch your back, so that you can fulfill your purpose. And you must ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment. It's a spiritual gift to know who your real friends are from those who are using you, who are at the effect of the Judas spirit. Now, Judas wasn't uh, traveling with Jesus and his, and his disciples to learn from Jesus and to help them. No, he was always, beloved, wanting to help himself. 
And I know many have asked, well, why would Jesus allow that? Again, Jesus knew he was going to the cross. There were people who were betraying him left and right. But he knew his ultimate destiny. And he was betrayed with a kiss. But I encourage you, beloved, don't be betrayed with a kiss. But for those who do give you a kiss or a hug, and they really love the Lord, and they just want what's best for you in your growth in the Lord, then those are your true friends. Judas, as we know, is a liar. He will lie right to your face. And you're probably thinking of somebody right now who's done that to you. Judas will backstab you, meaning he'll walk around wondering, you'll walk around wondering, why is this person not talking to me anymore? And that's why. It's because that person was influenced by spirit of Judas. He or she has used you and maybe abused you and used you up to satisfy what he or she wanted and now he's leaving you. Okay. Just wipe your feet. Move on. You know who that person was that the effect of. Don't blame the person. Blame the spirit. But pray against the spirit and, ask, and, and pray blessings upon the person and freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. Because the Judas spirit pits one side against another, always. And that's what you're seeing if you see that happening in your life. Judas doesn't care about destroying relationships. That's the end goal. He's trying to derive a benefit from both sides. That's what bullies do. And that's what the Judas spirit is doing. Okay, the Judas spirit seeks to divide the body of Christ. So that's why we're, we have formed my family to unite the body of Christ. So if there's anyone trying to divide the body of Christ, has the Judas spirit. And that steps on some toes, I know. But that includes anyone who's saying that their denomination is the only way. That's the Judas spirit. If they're saying putting doctrine over the Bible, that's the Judas spirit. The one who harbors the Judas spirit is the proverbial wolf's, wolf in sheep's clothing, as referenced in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. In order to defend against this spirit, as I've noted before, remember that the person affected by Judas, the Judas spirit, that is, has no power over you. No power. No power. No authority. That's right. I have laughed sometimes at these huge, horrific-looking demons. It's like, why do you dare try to come after me? Do you see who stands there beside me and within me? Do you dare do that? And that's how you have to speak to them. Do you dare? Do you dare come against me? Do you not know of whom I have born, been born do you know whose spiritual blood courses within me? You don't dare, how dare you, you spirit of Judas. Get thee behind me or else my Lord God in Jesus' name will bind you and cast you forth into, into hell. I'm not speaking to you. I hope you know that. I'm speaking to the spirit of Judas because I speak to you freedom. I speak to you love. I speak to you encouragement. Your Judas spirit, and there will be a Judas spirit if he hasn't already uh, impacted you or affected you. There will be. Uh, he won't prosper against you. He will only do what God allows him to do to set up uh, something in your life. That's right. God will allow some of these evil spirits to have their way for a season, but he will not allow the Judas spirit to affect you beyond which you can tolerate, or is even intended to strengthen you. Maybe it's the development of your discernment. Maybe it's getting you in the word of God. Maybe it's growing your maturity in Christ. When a Judas spirit, however, uh, presents himself to you, remember Romans 8, 
chapter uh, 8, verse 32, it says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So uh, bind the authority of the Judas spirit, which carries death to relationships, betrayal, envy, jealousy, strife, and greed. Decree, decree, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, that your feet are anointed just as Jesus' feet were before, were, were before his attack by Judas. They were anointed by the authority of God so that no weapons form, formed against you will prosper. Pray this to the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved of the Lord. Pray this, excuse me. Increase my portion so that the spirit of betrayal are broken and ineffective forever. Okay, enough of the Judas spirit. We're done with him. Let's move on to the Jezebel spirit. I can almost be assured that you are, have been or are currently at the effect of the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel spirit is a demonic influence that creates, creates rifts in churches, div, further division. See a theme here? But it will also call division in your marriage and in your relationships. Division is the modus operandi, operandi of the Jezebel spirit. It will cause marriages to be broken. It is cunning, deceptive, and seductive. It will draw you to somebody else, maybe another relationship, apart from the relationship that God has drawn you to, or apart from your own marriage. It will try to seduce you through social media, through pornography, through some enticement of some form, through a person who asks you to do something, or go see something, or read something that you shouldn't do, read or, or see. It operates primarily outside of the church, so it doesn't always infiltrate the church. It operates outside in society in places that are worldly, as Jezebel did and who was the poster child, if you will, for the Jezebel spirit. It's politically correct. It may be part of the cancel culture. It will try to accuse you of being uh, narrow-minded, bigoted, whatever. It will be, it's the accuser the Jezebel spirit. It will accuse you of not being very Christian when you call out evil. And it will try to cause you to doubt your salvation. The Jezebel spirit is a follower of social trends. And this is what, dis is what distinguishes the Jezebel spirit, the social trends that discount the Bible and Christianity in general. And we have a lot of that we have uh, statistically now those who uh, are in the majority in many cases in many countries uh, who doubt the validity of the Bible. And even in some countries like the UK, there are fewer Christians than there are those who are non-Christians. Okay, what's distinctive about the uh, Jezebel spirit? Because we need to know what the Jezebel spirit is doing in our lives. It seems to be differentiated from the other spirits in that it is more appetite driven than the other spirits since this one tends to exercise the most cunning and diplomacy. The Judas spirit is more easily identifiable as it was with certainly Jesus identified the Judas spirit before he uh, betrayed him. But this Jezebel spirit is a tricky one. It's cunning and deceptive. It's, a di it's diabolical how it... Uh, secretly tries to rip apart relationships. Relationships are paramount to God, and so this is the paramount strategy of the, the Jezebel spirit and the body of Christ or church from the inside out. It will, it will indeed try to infiltrate, but it will try to, let's say, uh, whether it tries to modernize, try to, to water down certain churches, certain places of worship. They become more worldly-based. This is the Jezebel spirit 
infiltrating those places and maybe it's in your life where uh, the Jezebel spirit is causing you to watch various uh, social media outlets so you can get a kind of a balanced approach to things. Why do you need to balance out what's right versus what's wrong? There's been a diametrical opposition now. Don't you see it between what what God has exposed as what is true, what is right, versus that which has been exposed as what is wrong. So the Jezebel spirit wants you to play all sides. It wants to dilute your faith. It wants to create a new uh, uh, lukewarmness in your faith. So let's uh, talk about uh, Jezebel now. And who was Jezebel? Uh, she was a Phoenician woman who turned uh, queen Jezebel and nothing, nothing about her was positive. Jezebel took the throne uh, with King Ahab uh, during a time of political uncertainty in Israel, and she worshiped foreign idols and introduced them to uh, Israel, as it says in 1 Kings chapter 18. She slaughtered the Lord's prophets, 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 4, which should show you what she the, what she, I say, she, this, this uh, Jezebel spirit will do uh, to the prophets. It wrongfully killed a man to take possession of a vineyard in First Kings chapter 21, uh, 1 through 22 in uh, verse 53. It threatened to kill the prophet Elijah in First Kings 19 and murdered anyone who protested her introduction of Baal worship into the kingdom. So the bell worship is anything today which is more of the world, more of society, more of the current social trends, and less of God and what is um, told about within the scripture. Okay. So she did all these things. So, so infamous was Jezebel's uh, sexual immorality an idol worship that the Lord himself refers to her in a warning to the church of Thyatira. Uh, Thyatira was a church now that Jesus forewarned of because of the Jezebel spirit. That's how powerful this spirit is. Now Jezebel uh, met a grisly death as she was thrown from a window uh, and trampled by horses, as it says in Second. Kings chapter 9, 30, verses 30 through 37, but not before she ruined many lives. So, uh, you know, God took her out, but she had already done a tremendous amount of damage. She's already, uh, the Jezebel spirit, I say she, these demons are not gender-based, but uh, the Jezebel spirit today has taken out so many lives, it ruins so many lives, it's infiltrated in sexual immorality, it's infiltrated in, in making people more of the world and of Christ. And what's distinctive about the uh, Jezebel spirit that you need to identify? A Jezebel spirit is an intelligent demonic influence that uses seduction and manipulation to gain control over people. So it's very seducing. Uh, it will feel good initially. Uh, the Jezebel spirit of working works with media platforms, a lot of media flat platforms. It's work. It's working uh, extensively on college campuses and in politics today. The Jezebel spirit is in public places, and so what it does is it tries to move those influences into uh, the body of Christ, into whether it be a church or whether it be a small group or whether it be your inner circle, whatever, a Jezebel spirit is always in alignment with a religious, quote unquote religious and or political spirit. It operates behind a facade of uh, decency, orthodoxy, wokeness, and a pious devotion. So it shows itself in those ways uh, because it, it, its goal is to control. That's the ultimate goal of the Jezebel spirit. If you, if you see that controlling spirit of somebody saying, you know, my way or the highway, for example, that could be very well the Jezebel spirit. You know, listen to me. Don't listen to that other person. That's the Jezebel spirit. 
and takes aim at uh, people in particular who are people in authority and the closest, and those who are closest to us. You know, our spouse, the Jezebel spirit, will come against your marriage. A pastor, it will come against the pastor. Uh, it has come against me, the elders, your boss perhaps, anyone else in leadership. That's the target of the Jezebel spirit. So if you've moved into a position of leadership, be prepared and be watchful of the Jezebel spirit who will come against you. And it does this to create a vacuum that it wants to fill and ultimately create chaos. So chaos is the modus operandi of of the devil. And the Jezebel spirit is ultimately the goal is to create chaos. We see it in our nation. We see it in uh, chaos in church divisions and divisions between left and right and you name it. I mean, that's the mark of the Jezebel spirit. Um, Seeing, you know, uh, children being taught about sex, sexual uh, matters in school, little children, little children. That's the Jezebel spirit that has entered into that school. The reason it's important to identify these spirits is because once you call them out and say, get behind me, you Jezebel spirit. I know who you are. You are no longer operating surreptitiously. That is behind the scenes. I've got your number. And that's why I'm going over this because you need to tell that spirit, I've got your number. I know who you are. You're not, you're not fooling me anymore. And I, I take authority in the name of Jesus Christ. So to defend against this Jezebel spirit, don't idolize people in high places. Our people have, have a celebrity status. Don't idolize them. Don't say, I've got to go here because that person always speaks the truth. The person may be speaking the truth consistently, but you need to not idolize anybody. You need to idolize our Lord God. God may be using this person, but as soon as that person starts uh, self-aggrandizing, that is that they're puffing themselves up, ah, you've identified the Jezebel spirit. And pray for the deliverance for that person who is at the effect of the Jezebel spirit. Because those possessed with the Jezebel spirit are celebrity seekers. They thrive on adulation. I mean, who doesn't? Who doesn't want to be, uh, you know, have people clap for them and shout praises to them? Uh, it's, it's human nature to be want to be encouraged, to be praised. That in and of itself is not evil. Uh, the Jezebel Spirit, however, seeks celebrity status, and that's where it crosses over. That's where people begin to feel uh, that they are actually who others say they are. You know, I have a, f- a favorite saying, you know, that uh, I saw it on a bumper sticker one, one thing, one time, and it said, I want to be the person that my dog thinks I am. <laughs> I want to be the person my dogs think thinks I am. That is, if you think a person is a is just higher than anyone else, or just this wonderful, absolutely fantastic person who has no problems, who has the perfect marriage, who has you know just says everything they say is is truthful, and you just you just hold them in such high esteem. Be careful because that's not the person. The person is has goes through the same struggles. I go through struggles. I go through every day. I am, uh, I'm, uh, I'm asking forgiveness of something or other that I did or said, or, you know, I, I got off the mark and, uh, and I, and I did something that, uh, it, it, we're human. Now we're born in new humans, you and I, hopefully, and I'll, I'll give you the opportunity later to, to receive Christ if you aren't, because you have to be today because you don't have a promise of tomorrow, but we still have faults and we need to be, we need to be aware of that, enough said. So what do we do when we encounter the Jezebel spirit? This one is a very tricky one, the Jezebel spirit. First, we go to God in prayer, obviously. Ask him for discernment. That is, Ask him for the gift of discernment to distinguish between evil spirits and those who are of God, spirits that are of God, and people who are speaking on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and pray for the person who is under the influence of the Jezebel spirit. Uh, uh, you know, that is jealous, hateful, uh, seduced. Uh, maybe you are at the effect of the Jezebel spirit. Maybe you're fighting some form of addiction and you're at the effect of the Jezebel spirit. So uh, one thing I'll share with you is what Jesus shared with me in heaven. And this is important to be released from the Jezebel spirit. Uh, Jesus said to me, he said, uh, when you stop judging yourself to me, when I, he said, then you will stop judging others. You see, a lot of the entree that we give to the Jezebel spirit is our insecurity, is the feeling that uh, we're being judged or that we're not good enough or, well, we're not, Christ, through Christ, he makes us good enough, okay? But what I'm saying is that when we feel like we're insecure, when we feel like we are uh, have to always prove ourselves, then what happens is there's a deflection that occurs when we start judging others accordingly. Because if we judge others, that puts us in a higher position, right? Elevates ourselves. Because then we're holier maybe than them, or we've judged that person unfairly, and maybe that person now, and sadly, a lot of parenting does this with a child that, you know, puts that, I'm, um, you know, do as I say, not as I do sort of thing. Well, what happens in, in the public domain or in families or ministry or whatever is that as Jesus told me that by releasing that judgment of yourself that is saying I know I have problems but I'm working on myself through Christ and therefore I'm not judging myself as about being good enough or not being holier enough or whatever then you'll notice the switch as Jesus taught me that we will judge others less harshly because we're confident of ourselves in Christ. So secondly, to fend off the Jezebel spirit, confront the person and tell them that they've wronged you, as it says in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. And, and you know, maybe point blank, tell them that they have a Jezebel spirit or let them know what that is. Maybe that will be too much, you know, <laughs> or, or the traits of a Jezebel spirit. Let's put it that way. They will most likely not appreciate the criticism, uh, but um, to resist the Jezebel spirit, uh, you and I must exercise authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Say this, I stand as a child of Jesus Christ and take authority and bind all Jezebel, Jezebel spirits. I decree confusion in the enemy's kingdom. May the light of Christ shine in the darkness. I unleash the blood of Jesus and take all authority for God's glory. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, to send your warrior angels to protect me. So pray that prayer. And if you prayed that prayer, then believe it. No second guess. You don't need to pray it a second time. You prayed it once and done, okay? All right, because uh, Jesus said the Pharisees would pray repeatedly over and over, some row, as though they didn't believe Jesus would do what you asked him to do. I tell you, every prayer that goes to heaven is answered with, it is of God, is answered with a yes. And it's poured out from the throne. God declares it. I've seen that declaration. He receives it. It's done, it breaks through the second heaven into our world and into ourselves as an answered prayer of yes. So don't, you don't need to you know, pray it, believe it, and claim it, okay? I mean, well, decree it, I'll use that word. All right, so uh, an example, and I'll finish with this before moving on to our final spirit, uh, and that is that I encountered the Jezebel spirit in uh, two churches, sadly. Um, in one church uh, several years ago, the pastor was trying to make the case that Jesus was only was not only tempted by Satan in the desert, as it says in Matthew chapter 
4 verses 1 through 11 that is tempted as in the as in this is important to clarify that satan tried to tempt jesus okay not that he truly got through to jesus with temptation he tried to okay but this pastor was trying to say that jesus actually felt a little temptation a little you know a little want to well, maybe if uh, I had the world, you know, it's, it's really ridiculous to to think that Jesus would. I mean, he had everything. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't tempted personally, right? He was uh, externally he was tempted. Okay, but this pastor was saying that he had the desires, you know, for these things. They didn't. It was wrong, and that's an abomination. Okay, so uh, it was another church that I saw that was uh, affected by the Jezebel spirit was a, what we commonly term um, a church that was uh, consumed with uh, what some call prosperity theology. And the pastor uh, stated that uh, he wasn't, had not reached a state of holiness yet because he didn't live in a particular uh, place around the city, suburb, that was the wealthiest suburb around the city he said i didn't i haven't arrived yet in christ he said essentially uh because i don't live there classic you know classic blasphemy about what it means to walk in christ i i pray for prosperity for a, all of you for you um but he equated holiness with prosperity and that's where it crosses the line so I walked out of that church. I've walked out of maybe two churches, and those were the two churches that were affected by the uh, Jezebel spirit. All right, well, let's move on to the Pharisaic spirit. Ooh, is this one ever strong? Okay, now that we've gone through that, please hang on uh, with me because this is very, very important. The Pharisaical spirit is alive and well today. It's primarily focused on judging others. And I gave a, a message before praying for your freedom. Uh, you can go back to that. Uh, it was my uh, it was a message that I gave on Easter, on uh, on judging others, and it refers to as uh, it's a religious spirit, uh, commonly called. Um, I'll, we're calling it a Pharisaic uh, spirit, but here's the demarcation of what a Pharisaic spirit does or what it's about. It's a religious spirit that makes relationship with God secondary and secondary uh, to even relation with people to uh, secondary to orthodoxy and human-made doctrines. So if you don't, you know, pray X amount of times, if you don't have your whatever in hand, if you don't, you know, you haven't, you know, pay your tithes, and I believe in pay the, paying tithes and all of that, but, you know, then the orthodoxy really consumes, takes precedence. Uh, I once had a pastor in a church uh, who said, those who aren't paving tithes are sitting in the back row. He joked about it, and I just, ooh, it just gave me the ewee jeebies like, whoa, dude, you know, that is so wrong. So orthodoxy is paramount. Uh, for those with that are at the effect or consumed or possessed with the pharisaic spirit. All right, now bear in mind when I go through these, we need to search ourselves to see if we're at the effect of the Pharise of all of these spirits as well. Okay, James uh, chapter one verse twenty-seven defines religion that is acceptable to God. So here's here's the real acceptable religion as defined in the Bible. Religion uh, that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
well, that's that last part, being polluted by the world. How do we do that? Well, yeah, we surround ourselves with those in our inner circle who are constantly holding us ourselves accountable, who are truly mature in Christ or getting there, um, and those who really want to see our, us being supported. Now, if you have a child who, a uh, son or daughter who is not of Christ, or you have a friend who's fallen away from Christ, it doesn't mean you have to get rid of them. No, I'm not. So when I, when it's not what I'm saying. It means to keep being polluted from the world is that when there's a movie, for example, or a show that has a lot of uh, SEX in it, you know, turn it off, get rid of it. You know, if there's if there's something that's polluting your world, uh, and it may be a relationship that is pulling you away from God. Uh, commonly, this would be a relationship, for example, if you're in a dating relationship and that person is uh, is not pulling you toward God, but pulling you away from God. That is, they don't want to go to church or they don't want to listen to this message. They don't want to, they don't want to join you in, uh, in praying together, that sort of thing. Then that's, that's, that's the spirit that you need to uh, walk away from. Um, because good religion is basically f- helping those who need help. That, that was the definition. That, that's, the, that's the definition of religion good religion in the Bible. And you may be saying, well, what about religion, Christianity? Well, yes, that's that's good, but I call it a faith. I call it a faith because the faith is in Christ. So my faith is one of relationship with Jesus Christ. Is it my religion? Well, my religion is to help those who are in need of help. And I can practice that religion because of my faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, back to the pharisaic now uh, spirit. The most well-known warning to the person possessed uh, or influenced by the pharisaic spirit comes in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And the King James reads as such. Judge not that ye, you, be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? So beware. This is a principle. This is a biblical principle. When we have the pharisaic spirit influencing us to judge somebody, realize this. This is a biblical principle. It will come back against us. In other words, that same standard by which we accuse or measure that other person will be measured against us. So we'll be eventually either indicted or convicted of what we have done, which is of the same nature as somebody else. We see so many, so many people now in the public domain and the social media news, what have you, who are blaming a side for the very thing that they're doing. They're saying somebody has lied when they're the liar. That's so common today. That's the pharisaical spirit at work. It judges because it goes back to what Jesus told me, judge not yourself so that you will not judge others, is that the the reverse of that is the same but equal, or the different but equal, is that in the King James Matthew 7, chapter 7, which is be careful who we judge because that same judgment will come back on us. So in other words, make sure we're correcting perhaps that person from a pure heart, that we don't have the same problem. Otherwise, we may not have the right to correct that person. And if we do, that may be a pharisaical spirit that is causing us to to judge that other person. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so what is the pharisaical spirit? Let's define it very clearly because it is so in effect today. And I virtually guarantee that you have been affected by it or will be at the effect of the pharisaical spirit. The demonic spirit practices or advocates strict observance of external forms and ceremonies of religion or conduct without regards to the spirit. So it's self-righteous and it's hypocritical. I dealt with that recently. Yes, I was at fault when somebody accused me, but then 
they were at fault for doing that same thing. Isn't that funny how it works that way? That's the pharisaical spirit in action. Sometimes it works out when we make amends or we confront the other person or we, you know, iron sharpens iron, you know, the, but oftentimes it doesn't come out well when the pharisaical spirit has his way. Unconfronted, the pharisaical spirit will dominate. I can tell you that. Jesus described uh, scribes and Pharisees as, of course, hypocrites. Uh, they looked good and clean on the outside, but they were dirty and dead on the inside. Now, here are the four marks of those who are self-righteous, religious, anti-Jesus people. I'm going to give you the four marks of a Pharisee. Number one, they trust in themselves for their righteousness and view others with contempt. They are what we uh, used to term holier than thou, okay? Jesus told his parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Uh, as it says in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, two men went up in the temple to pray, one a Pharisee. This is a parable that Jesus, of course, uh, spoke. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. I tell you, this man was not justified. That's Jesus speaking. This man was not justified, Luke 18, 9 through 10, 14. Uh, the same happened with when Jesus uh, confronted the rich, uh, rich man. And uh, the rich man said, well, uh, how do I enter the, you know, how do, what, how, how do I follow you? Or how can I, how can I be part of your inner circle? And basically Jesus said uh, to this rich man, he said, well, leave everything behind. And he said, well, I can't do that. But the first, the rich man said, uh, Jesus said to the rich man, um, follow the Ten Commandments. And the rich man said, oh, I follow all the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm good. You know, and... Uh, and then Jesus said, leave everything behind and follow me. And he said, oh, no. He went, he, Jesus called them out. They had broken the Ten Commandments. That's why the Ten Commandments are convicting. They judge. But it's only through the grace of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Okay, but the pharisaical spirit will tell us that we are to live according to the Ten Commandments and abide by them. And if we do fall... That is, if we do, if we do conflict or or do something against the Ten Commandments, so as we do don't do the Ten Commandments, even even one of them, you know, then then we're condemned, and we have to, you know, we're we're headed to hell. But that's not grace. Grace says, ask forgiveness and Jesus will give it to you. And not only will he do that, but he will remove the stain of that unforgiveness or that, or that whatever the 10 can, that one of the 10 commandments has been uh, abrogated or, or defied. He will wash that sin as far as the east is from the west. He'll just wash it away. Don't turn back. You're, you're cleansed, you're good. Okay, that's grace. But not, that's not the, the pharisaic spirit, no. Because the pharisaic uh, spirit will tell the person influenced by that spirit uh, everything that they should do should be to be noticed by others. Again, that holier than thou. They love to have the outward signs of holiness. They love to dress up in garbs and walk out and... You know, they less like to, you know, once, the, once that pulpit is in front of them, boy, they're, again, not to say everyone who stands before, I've stood before uh, in back of pulpits, so don't get me wrong, but that but there's something about standing in that pulpit that says, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm in charge now and you're listening. There's something that happens in the pulpit. I don't believe in pulpits anymore. 
I've used them because I use notes, right? But anyway, <laughs> what I'm getting to is that they will often encourage people to listen only to them, only to them, when making claims about the truth. Do as I said, as I say, not as I do, in other words. Matthew chapter 23, verse 5 says it this way. They do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their charms and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Okay, so that's the first identifier of a pharisaical spirit. Number two, and there are four of these that I'll get to very quickly. They loved being honored and elevated above others. Ooh, do they love it? Those who are influenced by the pharisaical spirit. Okay. Matthew chapter 23, verses six through seven says this, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk into the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. This, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, is why I do not call myself pastor, prophet, or any of those things. If you want to call me that, that's, that's your deal. But I don't call myself that because I operate unto the service of my Lord. I don't need a title. I've had titles before. Believe me, when I was in executive positions, did I have titles? And did I seek after those titles? I wanted that, uh, that senior manager. I wanted that VP title. I wanted that president title. I wanted that CEO title. But that may work in the world, but it does not w in the world, world, but it doesn't work in God's world. We are to be humble. Okay, number four. They feel compelled to justify themselves to men to keep up appearances. So that's why we've seen so many people who have fallen in public ministries. I mean, so many. And because we hold them up to a higher standard. Well, that's not entirely fair. We've got to know because we are influenced by the pharisaical spirit. When we hold them up to a higher standard, we've got to know that they struggle as much as we struggle. And so we have to be careful the pharisaical spirit doesn't work in reverse for us. Jesus said to the Pharisees this in Luke 16, 15. He said, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. So the Phariseeism, if you will, often occurs when someone is in a church leadership role. And, and I know that temptation. You know, I, I'd been in the, the quote unquote real world you know, I, I was going to work to earn a paycheck. I'll put it that way. Uh, I know. Um, so, but when I get a, got into a leadership role in ministry, my Randy K Ministries and now what we're leading the effort with my family. By the way, you can go to myfamilyworldwide.org to get more information on uh, my family, the, the movement, the union, I call it, the union my family uh, around the world of bringing the body of Christ together. Uh, when, when I got involved in this and leading these efforts, um, there was that pharisaical spirit that reared his ugly head. And I thought, uh, oh, am I important? Didn't last very long. Because, ooh, did I get a slap in the face by the Lord. <laughs> I loved it, too. I loved it, too. He told me, Randy, you are no better, no more holy, no more of significance than that person over there who worships me. Now, here's the irony of that. And this applies to you as well, which is not the pharisaical spirit, but it's how God sees us. You and I, you are the most important person in the world to God. He looks at you as though you're the 
head honcho or the the chief priest or whatever i mean you're the the another uh, colloquialism that cats me out you're you're it for god let that be your signifier of your identity of your esteem don't let the world uh convey that esteem you don't need the world's approval you need god's approval we need when we have that when we're in christ okay and we're following after his way what well, may start out as a sense of love and duty to serve a church membership uh, or maybe a small group you have or a circle of friends or whatever uh, can turn into desire to be in control of, of church policy in the case of a pastor or a priest or whatever and uh, doctrine. It's that control spirit that is so important to the pharisaical spirit that influences or possesses a person. I've sat on uh, several boards of church ministries and, and churches themselves. And I have to say for, at the, that the pharisaical uh, spirit is the most seductive spirit in ministry for pastors and leaders. Absolutely. And, and if you go into that leadership position, and it may just be with a, a circle, I say may just be, it may be with a circle of friends, <laughs> and your ministry is as important as the ministry that I have, or, or some other uh, place of leadership that, that the Lord has you in, um, you're going to be seduced by that pharisaical spirit. It is inevitable, I tell you that, beloved. I have experienced that over and over. I've seen ministries torn apart by the pharisaical uh, spirit. I've seen those who are, I've had to coach and I've had actually removed uh, on boards, I've removed uh, ministers, uh, leaders of ministries who have, uh, who have failed uh, egregiously. And I've seen that pharisaical spirit rear its head. That person has said, if, this, if I go down, this ministry goes down. I, I've seen that, that pharisaical spirit just, whoa, just rise up. And this person was holy and the nicest person, all of a sudden, bang, the pharisaical spirit finally reveals himself. Because the pharisaical spirit is often justified by a pastor or leader as a means of protecting the flock, which is good, shepherding the flock, when in fact, the pharisaical spirit influenced person is trying to control that body or that entity. So when it crosses over from protecting to controlling, that's the pharisaical spirit. Now, a modern-day Pharisee, just as their counterparts 2,000 years ago, wants to stay in power. That is the ultimate goal, stay in power. Uh, that, that's it. You know, these, some of, I almost feel like it's healthy, if a pastor, you know, gets so adulation, people get so drawn to, to do something else, almost like being elected to the House of Representatives, you know, every two years, whatever, you know. I just feel that sometimes it's healthy, just like it was healthy for me to be in industry for 30 years and leave that and be new as I still am, you know, and relatively speaking to many who have been decades in ministry. I have a fresh approach, fresh eyes, fresh this. So I think it's healthy. Uh, but those, but holding on to power is quintessential to the pharisaical spirit. Uh, and I think that's the heart of it, wanting to hold on to power. I really do. Regulating everyone and everything within control. Uh, so, that, the, the, so that those who are controlled by the pharisaical spirit, are, they become legalistic and dictatorial. And I've been in, in churches and ministries where uh, the, the leader or whatever of, of that body just has the final say and won't listen to counsel. And when that happens, whew, I know that the pharisaical spirit has taken over and we have some praying to do, some work to do. Uh, they usually, uh, everything that they do then, if they are seeking control, which oftentimes happens with the, the pharisaical controlled person is they uh they usually uh that their moral failure their sin whatever gets covered up either consciously or unconsciously 
Now, I'm not saying that they need to confess that they've done a sin. If they confess it to God and ask forgiveness, you know, they've asked forgiveness. But, but you know, they're, they're controlling because they're trying to cover up, basically. That, that's when it becomes a problem uh, by putting on the facade of being uh, faithful to Scripture, at least their version of it, uh, even though they don't always follow the guidance of Scripture themselves, you know. And I must admit, I've used a four-letter word, okay? I confess that to you. And I've asked uh, forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm not sinless, in case you thought otherwise. <laughs> uh, I know you haven't, uh, but neither does my wife or my family. They know, but uh, anyway, they know I love the Lord. That's, that's why it counts. I love him so, so much because he loves me. There we go. All right. He loves you. Now, what's the antidote to the pharisaical spirit? I'll let you know. Here it is, the dose. I'm going to write a prescription for you right now. The antidote to the pharisaic spirit is humility. Humility. It's the most observed quality in heaven and the least observed in this world. I can tell you, it's diametrically opposed to this world. In heaven... Everyone is humble because we know that we're here in heaven. We are washed. We are enjoying all of this because of God and because of no one else. So we don't need to prove anything to anybody. So heaven's that way. Completely humble people in a place where there's nobody trying to outdo anyone else. Okay. But in this world, obviously that's not the case. So, I'm going to tell you something here in Psalm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Psalm chapter 51, verses 16 through 17, which says, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are, broken, are a broken spirit, it says in Psalm. A broken spirit and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That, that, that is the mark of the mature believer. I believe that. The mark of the true, true believer, as it says in Psalm. Now, even as I, I write this, uh, you know, script that I'm going off of, um, as I speak this, I should say, I feel a sense of brokenness about me a healthy sense of brokenness. Because who am I to speak to you? Who am I? I? I don't believe it's a false sense of humility. I just know that I've stood face to face before Jesus and been broken, sobbing. And I've stood before the throne in my spirit body in awe. Ah, oh, God, maker of heaven and earth, and to be in that midst and now come back and not, not still have that effect carry over as it does. I feel like it says in Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 28, Where it says, woe to you, for you are like a whitewashed tomb, which on the outside appears beautiful, but inside is full of dead man's bones and uncleanness. For you too, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. But by the sake of Jesus Christ, but for Jesus Christ, I am a, I'm a worthless human being, but for Jesus Christ, I mean everything to him. Now here's how you confront a pharisaic spirit. Gather the facts. Don't go full force before somebody or challenge or even pray for somebody 
with a fursitic spirit until you have the facts. As I have. Make sure you've got your ducks in a row, as they say. Sorry for the colloquialism for those of you in Africa or, or China or whatever. So also look for witnesses who are reliable people with evidence. Again, know the truth. And now confront the person that's operating under that evil spirit. I know it's going to be hard, but confrontation is good because more than likely that person who's been esteemed with the pharisaical spirit uh, is not, has not been confronted. Has not been confronted. I can tell you so many times I've spoken to a person in leadership and I've confronted them and they've said, well, nobody told me that. And they've appreciated me telling them that, okay? Uh, and, if, and if you are the effect of the pharmaceutical spirit, surround you with people who can be honest with you, can tell you when you're wrong. I, I did that yesterday. I accused somebody. I, 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 I just, you know, I, I removed uh, some of their influence because uh, I thought you know, they had offended me. And I had to go back to that person and apologize I was confronted and we sharpened each other and we're good now. We're better than before, okay? So uh, confront the person. Uh, they will, uh, sometimes they'll deny any wrongdoing uh, when confronted. I've faced that as probably you have as well. I have a story behind this that I'll briefly tell you, okay? Uh, so I was on uh, I was on the board of directors. I was actually the the chairman of the board for a ministry. It was a large ministry, somebody who was well known. And I knew the family quite well. Uh, we knew the family uh, uh, quite well. They were friends of ours. So a wife, the, the head of the ministry's wife called me and she said that so-and-so, the head of the ministry uh, had left, that apparently he had gotten online met somebody online. He was a married man with two uh, young adult uh, children. And she said, um, he's left. He's gone to be with that other woman. Now, we're, I won't tell you where we were at the time, but anyway, this person was anywhere in the USA or in the world. Didn't know. Not a clue how to get a hold of this this uh, ministry head. So I prayed and I prayed. I said, dear Lord, just tell me where, where he's at, where he's at. Well, lo and behold, the Lord gave me the exact hotel where he was at. And it was over 2,000 miles away in a, in a place that wasn't even a major city. And so he gave me that exact hotel. How many hotels are there in, in the country or in the world? You know, tens of thousands. So anyway, but he gave me one. So I called that hotel. And I said, it's so-and-so there. Checked in, I'd like to speak with so-and-so. And the receptionist said, uh, okay, I'll, I'll put you through. <laughs> and this person picked up the phone. Can you imagine? Can you well imagine his shock? And I said, uh, so and so, this is Randy here. And the first first words out of his mouth were, I'm gonna put the phone down right now. He was convicted, so. So I said, I've never said this before to anybody, but I, feel I, I felt I had a word from the Lord. So I said, if you don't get out that door, hotel, door right now and get on the next flight leaving that woman who's in your room and, and I don't care if you leave things unpacked you got to get out now in the next 30 seconds or whatever it was I said God is going to imagine me saying this I've never said that to anybody God is going to strike you dead Phone went down. He caught the next flight, got back home, and went under a 
restoration with his wife and his family. And they've been uh, married ever since. That's confronting the pharisaical spirit. Watch out. Watch out if you're in a leadership position. Because when that sin is uncovered, and it will be, if it's not addressed, then it will be addressed in another way. Okay. So we've got to pray if we hear a bad report about someone, maybe even talk to the person, as I certainly did in that case. But don't treat them like outcasts. Please don't treat them like outcasts. Don't reject them and expect uh, fruit. Don't, and this happens far too often. Somebody gets thrown out of a position of leadership and then all of a sudden they become a pariah. Please don't do that. No, don't listen to the devil. That's exactly what the devil wants. No, the devil is a liar. He was, will always try to make somebody look bad, even when somebody has not, has not sinned. The devil will still try to spread a rumor or a lie about that person that is not true. And that's where we have to be careful not to point the finger especially if they serve God, especially if somebody is serving God, especially because you know that they have a bullseye on them, a bullseye for the enemy. All right. Or if the person has offended you, just let, let it go. Let it go. Sometimes that's the case. There were times when Jesus just walked away from a, an angry crowd of Pharisees right in the middle of arguing with them. He just, Jesus just walked away because he knew there was no point in arguing with them. The Sermon on the Mount, beloved, and I'll end with this, has the answers to all of these ways in which we can deal with these spirits of the Antichrist, these demonic spirits, which are so prevalent today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's principle number one described in the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. Number two, how have you or have you forgiven that person? True forgiveness always brings healing. Matthew chapter 23. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, or rather their hypocrisy. He exposed their attitude to what is what it was, a blatant lack of love for God and mankind. As it says in John chapter 15, verse 20. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. So if they've done it to you, they've done it before unto God. Be at peace. Because if they could convict the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who sits on the throne today, they can do it to you. Okay. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not what they know. Excuse me. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. He said that on the cross. We have to do the same. Everything that Jesus did or said, we have to model that. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And the New Living Translation says, Jesus was following his own teaching. Even at a critical moment, he knew he could not hold on even a hint of unforgiving heart if he was to be, to be victorious over death. He knew he had to forgive them because he was taking the sins of humankind upon himself. Now, my experience with the pharisaic uh, spirit may surprise you. It has to do, and this is how I will end this, and YouTube, please don't take me off for this. Please because you'll, you, I think you'll like this at the end because I'm, I'm going to talk about the pharisaic spirit uh, as it relates to a question that is often posed but to me. Uh, should I, should, should I or should I take the uh, COVID vaccine or I could, took the COVID vaccine and was that the mark of the beast, okay? So that was a time 
beloved of the Lord, when I was asked these questions, that the pharisaic spirit was in control. In many cases, some pastors uh, closed their churches. Many in the Christian community uh, tended to shame those who got the vaccine or they shamed those churches um, that remained open even during the uh, pandemic. So there was a lot of shaming going on during that time. It became almost a religious uh, status uh, in some circles to refuse the vaccine and fear gripped those who uh, were faced with taking the vaccine. There was a lot of fear. Is this the mark of the beast? Is this the mark of the beast? I'll answer that question for you. I'll answer that question for you right now. So I messaged the people who wondered whether they should uh, be uh, condemned for taking the vaccine was this. We are free in Christ. That's what I, what I told everyone. We are free in Christ. We are free in Christ. Now, there's a mark of the beast. And I'll tell you what that is. Okay, right now because the pharisaical spirit has really distorted this whole thing. Uh, and, and by accepting the vaccine as the mark of the beast, we're going to miss the mark of the beast, which is coming. It is coming. Okay. So obviously you should use wisdom in taking any drug. You should be well informed. You should know what the, re, what the uh, side effects are and all of those things, which have to be published, at least in America and uh, in Europe. Uh, be prudent uh, and write about taking any drug, vaccine or otherwise. But in the case of the vaccine, the governments or authorities were not asking us to deny Jesus Christ as our Lord. This wasn't part of it, uh, which would have been the way in which the beast would have operated uh, for people who actually took on the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast will be an outright denial of Jesus as our Lord. That's how you know the mark of the beast. That's how you know the mark of the beast. Is that the mark of the beast will come with a caveat. That we must deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now each of us, as it says in Romans chapter 14 verse 4 stands or falls before his own master. And that live, we are to live as free, as people who are free. Free from the fear of man or humankind, fear of being labeled, fear of being called a compromiser, fear of being doubted as not really part of the courageous resistors, especially when you know that thousands of those resistors are courageous, wise, thoughtful on both sides. But fear is not freedom, beloved. Fear is not freedom. I stand before you. I am professing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Taking the vaccine or not is not going to change that. But if somebody asks me to deny my Lord by taking on a mark of some kind, you bet your bottom dollar that we must say no, okay? That's, that's when you know that you know, okay? It wasn't with the vaccine. You are free to say with integrity, my decision to be vaccinated or not is not a political decision. It is not a, a left-wing or a right-wing thing. It is my freedom and Christ to decide, okay? Here's what you have to know, as I told you, I'll finish with this. You have to know about the mark of the beast to be clear on this, okay? When the Antichrist is revealed, as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, it will be clear who he is and how the number 666 identifies him. The Bible is clear that receiving the mark of the beast is connected with worshiping the beast in its image. I'll say that again. You will know the mark of the beast because it will come with worshiping the mark of the beast and its image. In other words, people don't just get this uh, mark by accident. It's not just going to be by accident. You'll have no question that this is the mark of the beast when it happens. They got the mark of the beast because they were beast worshipers. As I show you the verses on your screen that testify of this. That's why Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11 says that those who receive the mark will be punished with God's eternal wrath. They worshiped the beast instead of God. So that's how you will know. 
the mark of the beast. Therefore, a genuine Christian could not get tricked into taking the mark of the beast. It just won't happen. Any more than a genuine Christian could get tricked into losing his or her salvation. That would not happen. It's just not possible for you to get tricked into losing your salvation. The pharisaical, by the way, you're saved. You know it. Don't let people tell you you're not. If you've confessed your sins unto the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have asked forgiveness for what he did on the cross for you, if you invite his Holy Spirit to come within you, as I'm inviting you if you have not yet done that, if you have invited the Lord Jesus Christ to take control of your life, and if you believe in your heart as such, then you are born anew. You are born anew. You are saved. Now, once you are born anew, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you don't need to be born again and born again and born again and born again. That would be absurd to the extreme. What you need to do is if, like me, you have sinned, ask forgiveness. Now, I'm not going to, I've, I've talked about salvation messages, assurances, uh, I've addressed. scared a lot of people of their salvation. And there's a difference between convicted and condemned. If you feel convicted, you say, okay, I'm just going to ask you know, forgiveness or I'm just going to do things differently. If you feel condemned, you feel like I will never have assurance of my salvation. That is condemnation. If somebody makes you feel like you will never have an assurance of your salvation, surely enough, they have a pharisaical spirit. I'm telling you this, please hear me. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. The pharisaical spirit shames people. I hear people influenced by the pharisaical spirit even saying that people who get the, got the vaccine had lost their salvation, which was absurd. Which was absurd. Fear always accompanies the pharisaic spirit. Fear of being ridiculed. Fear of losing one's salvation. All of those are marks of the pharisaical spirit. And I'll end with this note. Now, having presented the largest number of Christ-honoring stories on social media, afterlife stories, near-death experiences, afterlife when people have clinically died like yours truly, I faced a lot of people influenced by the pharisaical spirit, as you can well imagine. I've shown scriptures, I've done teachings on multiple occasions to multiple audiences and yet there are those who do not deny who still deny I should say Christ honoring afterlife or near-death experiences I'm not talking about those who are talking about reincarnation and being deceived in some way I'm not denying their story I'm not saying they lied I'm just saying that they it wasn't this wasn't uh, the spirit of of Christ it wasn't his angels that were that they were seeing they were the other side okay I'm saying that Christ honoring, there are still those in the church who refuse these. Now, I, I get it. I, I didn't accept them either. But that's the, f before I had my own experience, by the way. <laughs> but that's the pharisaical spirit. Over 90% of churches don't even present heaven in scripture. They don't talk about heaven. Why is that? Heaven is mentioned in multiple places within scripture. As is hell, Sheol. And even more would not follow or allow an afterlife survivor to share their experience in their church for fear of ridicule. That's the pharisaic spirit. And because they're skeptics, as I used to be before my own uh, NDE experience, I had a pharisaical spirit on me. And God took that down. Uh, oh, did he take that down? It was uh, on a hospital bed and my heart stopped and I've suffered physical damage ever since, by the way. I have damaged valves, I have damaged organs. 
uh, from when I died. I couldn't walk. All that. I that that was on. That's on on me for anything that I did to deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying God wanted that. I'm just saying that that I had the pharisaical spirit on me. I've taught in churches. Okay. Now I'd like to pray with uh, each of these uh, that each of these spirits would be broken from you. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for you right now. Are you ready? Let's get in. Let's get into it. I invite the Holy Spirit to take control where you are, where I am, because I'm going to pray now. Whether you have a have been at the effect or in outside or internally by a Judas spirit by a Jezebel spirit, uh, or by a pharisaical spirit. Now, Lord, I ask that you would reveal those, those to us right now where we're at the effect of them, both either personally or outside. And Lord, I pray for your beloved, my family, that you would break every bondage by these spirits you would break every bondage now. Give us an increase of faith to know, as your word says, whatever we pray believing that it is indeed established. So that, Lord, we have a faith, the faith to know that you are indeed breaking those bondages, breaking those shackles. We come against the spirit of Judas, we come against the spirit of Jezebel. We come the, against the spirit of the Pharisees. And we ask, Lord, I ask, on behalf of my brothers and sisters in Christ, on behalf of those even who are listening who are not, not know you as Lord and Savior, that you would break those shackles and that if that spirit does not heed this prayer, Lord, that you would notify that spirit that that spirit will indeed have to because we pray, pray in the name of Jesus Christ and that spirit is at the effect of your judgment if he does not obey. So now we rejoice. There is freedom in Christ. We thank you. We praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, for what you did on the cross to break every shackle, of the, every 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 form of sin, whether it be a demonic form, whether it be a, a, a curse that is spoken over, whether it be anything that impedes our relationship with you, that you have broken that by the authority and power of Jesus Christ. And we praise you for that. We rejoice in our freedom. We rejoice in our freedom. And I have some great news for you, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, as a free person in Christ, you are born anew through the Spirit of Jesus Christ, be of good cheer, because heaven is in your future. Take care, and God bless.